Today we have Pastor Dave Jenkins with us and he's going to share just a word of encouragement regarding prayer. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see your smiling faces out there. Listen, miracles still happen. I actually got up and came to the early service this morning. (laughs) Much can be said about that, but I bring a, uh, before I uh, leave to go do some other things here this morning, I wanted to come and and, uh, give an Uh, uh, a message of invitation. In the book of Acts, we learn from Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, that at one point, uh, King Herod, who was beginning to uh, persecute the early disciples, he had uh, James, the brother of John, arrested and they executed him. Some of the people in the leadership in Israel, they said, okay, we like that. Good, good. We want you to do more of that. So Herod went out and had his uh, military officers uh, arrest Simon Peter. And they threw him in jail. And they were going to do the same to him in in a couple of days. One night, they were all sleeping in the jail. Peter was chained by both hands to guards on both sides. They were all asleep. By the way, when the church heard that this was happening, what did they do? His friends and fellow believers in Christ, they began to pray earnestly. I can only imagine. So here, after their prayer, they were still praying, and here in the jail in the middle of the night, this angel comes, light shone in the jail cell, it said, and the angel reached down and hit Peter on the side and said, wake up, get your clothes on. And as he did, the chains on both of his arms fell off. He got ready to go. He thought it was a dream. He began to walk out of the jail, walked completely out, scot-free. And he went to where he knew his friends would be staying. And so he got to that house. Guess what they were doing? They were still praying. And he knocked on the door and a little girl, a little servant girl named Rhoda came to the door. When she opened up the little window there, it was Peter. She was so excited, she ran back into the house to tell others and left Peter out on the street. And he kept knocking. A lot to be said about that. Um, You know, prayer changes things. When we pray, things happen that would not have happened if we hadn't prayed. One Christian writer of the last century said this about this story. He said, the angel fetched Peter out of prison, but prayer fetched the angel. When I first came into this church and we moved into Guymon, uh, I'm retired, but still doing lots of things in ministry. We came here. David and I have been friends for many years. And I heard about his, um, I want to use the word God awful, but uh, that would not be appropriate. It's that early morning, early watch prayer. At what time? Five? I'm a night owl. I know five o'clock in the morning, but it was always at the end of a day and not at the beginning. So I said, David, I can't do that. But I am a man, I want to stir up prayer. And so could we start a later watch prayer ministry? And we did. Now about a year we've been going. On Monday evenings, my friend, you're invited right back here in this uh, chapel room. On Monday evenings at 6 o'clock p.m., we gather to fetch the angel. Sometimes we know when it happens. Sometimes we have no idea. But you're invited, my friend. If you want to just come and you say, I'm not very good about praying out loud, you can come and sit with us and nod your head and say, Lord, I agree with that prayer, every bit of it. Or you can come and with your voice and with your your heart in, uh, in be involved with us in praying. We go down this list. We have lots of people to pray for. And uh, I'm always certain that we're out by seven. So it's one hour. I remember Jesus' words to the disciple. Could you not tarry with me one hour? Listen, you're invited to come tomorrow evening, any Monday night at 6 p.m., right over here, come through the office door, 
and we're going to fetch the angel together. Amen. Hey, it's good to see you this morning. Blessings. It is good to see everybody this morning. And uh, there is an early morning prayer watch also at 5 a.m. Um, God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is he's good. good. Now, if you join me in our call to worship, who do you say that I am? Jesus, you are the Christ, Son of the living God. If we believe in Jesus and follow Jesus, he promises to make us fishers of men. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, we choose to be crucified with you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, we want you to be our Savior and Master. Whoever loves me must obey me and work alongside of me. Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, we commit ourselves to knowing you and seeking your kingdom first and foremost. Freely you have received, and now freely give. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we want to follow you in the steps of Jesus. Please help us to live practical and productive lives of disciple making. The college kids also get up at 5 a.m. on Sunday or on Thursday morning. So that's just a little tidbit. They can do it. I know you can too. <laughs> on this Sunday morning, we come here seeking a shift from ordinary to the sacred. I invite you to recall that this that it is the season of Lent, a time when God calls us in a low, urgent voice. Listen, Jesus is being drawn to Jerusalem. Where is God calling you to? What is God calling you to do? Let us pray. Loving God, as we journey through this holy season of Lent, may we be open to your presence. Give us the strength to make the changes that are needed in our lives and the courage to take on the work of transforming the world. Amen. Let's all stand together and sing Yesu, Yesu.
You may be seated. So very glad to see each of you with us today. And that particular hymn is a reflection on John chapter 13 when Jesus meets with his disciples and takes the towel and the basin of water and physically washes their feet. That whole act of servanthood is an example for us in dealing with our friends and neighbors, ways we can help them discover what God has in mind for their lives. The theme today is the theme of disciple making. We know this was the final instruction that Jesus gave to his disciples, that he wanted them to go and make disciples. They were already following him. They were a part of his disciple band. Now he wanted them to go out and do the same with others. So we're going to kind of dig into that theme today. So I hope you've got your thinking cap on and you've got your uh, gardening tools, your shovel and your uh, fork, uh, so we can dig in and discover exactly what that looks like. Join me in our prayer as we explore this theme together. Lord Jesus, you invite us to become your disciples who follow you and who join you in making disciples of all nations. Please empower us to walk in your footsteps, pray with you, witness about you, and reproduce for you. Holy Spirit, please make us faithful and fruitful disciple makers. We want you to remind us, teach us, and empower us to obey the gospel and share the gospel. Help us to hear your word, obey your word, and share your word. For your glory of God and the good of others, we pray. Amen. As our ushers come forward, we'll receive tithe, offering, and faith promise gifts this morning. Our stewardship reflection comes out of Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Part of our children's moment this morning will be a noisy offering, so if you need to kind of find those coins or bills in your pocket or your billfold or your purse, just a little heads up. (laughs) Lord, so grateful to be together today for worship. And as we heard this text again from Malachi, it's interesting that you want food in your house and we know you don't need food and you don't need our money and nothing that we possess is needed by you rather you want us to give so there would be food in your house for others that we would be able to feed others and clothe others that we would be able to share your good news with others so as we give we give to grow your kingdom we give to be disciples and make disciples today. I pray that you'll use Victory Memorial and every one of us as members, as disciple makers, growing and serving alongside of you. Bless the gift today. Bless the giver. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Junior Bell Choir and special guest artist. We appreciate that. Please stand as we sing our doxology to... You may be seated. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Duncan. Our chancel choir has prepared an anthem for us, I Surrender All. Let's enjoy that together. <clears throat> Thank you, choir. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Gayla. Beautiful anthem. If our children will come forward, we're going to start with a noisy offering.
One more coming. For what? Oakley? Oakley is coming, yes. Wait, what? Where is she? She's a coming. Oh, she's upstairs. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. There she kids. comes. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Like, She'll be coming round the mountain. She'll be coming round the mountain. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Singing hi, hi, yippee, yippee, hi. Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful for this noisy offering each month on this last Sunday as we support missions. We want boys and girls, moms and dads, grandparents to come to know you. We're helping with education, with health <laughs> needs. Lord, we are being able to feed children at school. We are so glad to be a part of different missions. Bless each penny, each nickel, dime, quarter, each dollar bill. Help the light of Christ to shine brightly and his love to be known by many. We prayed in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Now, listen, listen. Wait, don't go. You get a double helping today. Double helping? What? Double helping. Oh, that's, that's just the prayer for our missions. Now, for the children's conversation. Today we're going to talk a little bit about how do you make disciples? Do you have any idea, Oakley, how do you make a disciple of Jesus? Any idea how you can? Listen. You can listen. What else do you have to do? Listen to your mom. You listen to your mom. What else do you have to do? How do you make one? I listen. Listen, listen, listen. Yes, yes. But you've got to do more than listen. And be happy. You've got to be happy. You've got to invite somebody to worship, to come to worship with you. That's one way. What else can you do? How can you help somebody else don't, become don't, a Christian? Don't be mean. Don't be mean. Be nice. Be, be caring and loving. Nice. You've got to be nice to people, oh, right? Right, right. Uh huh. What else? Anybody? You've got to pray for people. Pray that other people can also come to know Jesus, and then God will use you to help them. So let's talk a little bit now about if you want to be a an athlete. Anybody like to play basketball? Anybody? I love playing basketball. You do? And football maybe? Me too. I like football? No. Basketball. basketball. Okay. All right. We're going to stick with basketball, y'all. If you want, listen, if you want to be a basketball player. I love being a basketball. I'm going to show 100 miles away. I'm really glad to hear that. The first thing you've got to have is desire interest. If you're not interested in, in basketball, if you have no desire, guess what? You're not going to play it. So the very first thing you've got to have is interest. And then you've got to have opportunity. You've got to have a ball and maybe a basketball hoop or a team that you can play with. And then you can start to learn how to play basketball. And once you get involved, then you've got to get committed. Yeah. You've got to say, listen, I want to be on this team. I'm going to practice. I'm going to play soccer. I can take a thousand miles away. Mm -hmm. I've lost it, y'all. You've got, you've got to be committed. And then, as you work and play with others, you can all grow together and become good athletes, good basketball players. You've got to learn the skills. If you're a basketball player, you've got to do what? Dribble. You've got to be able to shoot and if people are trying to shoot you've got to be able to block defend you've got to be able to pass to one another there are lots of skills you've got to learn but all of you learn together and finally you can become a a starter a good player so it's the same with being a disciple you're not going to be a disciple of Jesus unless you are interested unless you Make use of the opportunities God gives you. Unless you belong to a team and you work together to get good at the skills that God wants you to have. So let's pray together. Lord, I pray for Wyatt that he'll be a good disciple and he'll make disciples. I pray for all of us as we sit here that each of us will be a good disciple, that we will be interested and practice and be able to help others find how wonderful it is to be a disciple. Use us, we pray. And everybody said? Oh, no. Amen.
of you got your seats. I was reminded of one of my professors who said, most prayers can end with you saying either amen if you agree, or if it's really difficult, oh my, or oh me. <laughs> Today I heard an oh no. <laughs> I hope you're not sitting there saying, oh no, me, a disciple maker. <laughs> I hope we're all saying, amen, Lord, so be it. Make me a disciple maker. Join me in our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy and obey with gladness what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture today comes out of the gospel according to Luke, reading from verse 1 to verse 23. After this, the Lord, and that's Jesus that's being referred to, after this, Jesus appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, and I want to underline that again. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, First say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, Will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. 
all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. This is the word of the Lord. A couple of questions for you to think about today. Maybe you can discuss them with your family, or if you see me in the week, you can discuss them with me. I'd love to hear your thoughts. How does one go about making a disciple? If this is the main work of a Christian to go and make disciples, how do we do it? How do you do it? How do we do it here at Victory Memorial? How would God want us to go about doing it? Number two, who has God had on your heart to disciple? Is there anyone among your family, friends, neighbors that God has laid on your heart that he's wanting you to disciple? And number three, what resources do you have that God can use to disciple others? This is a important topic. It's a big topic. And so we're only going to have a few minutes today to kind of dig into it. But I want us to dig into it. So I hope you put your gardening gloves on, get your pick, your shovel, your fork, and dig deep into the soil of disciple making. So let's start this morning by what makes a disciple to start with. Who is a disciple? Everyone has the potential of being one, but how do you get there? How do you move from being somebody who is lost or disconnected to becoming a disciple? And you can answer, say it. Where does it start? You've got to be saved, born again. And that happens as you maybe discover, whoever the person is, discovers that their relationship with God is not what it should be. And in order for that relationship to connect, to become what God intended, you've got to move closer to God. You've got to find a relationship where you are connected and close to God. And we call that getting saved or being converted or being born again. Every person becomes a disciple when they are born again. That's what Jesus said. Born from above or born again. Born of the Spirit of God. And that only happens if a couple of things become real to someone. The first is this. Jesus says, nobody comes to me unless... How does that scripture finish? No one comes to Jesus unless... Unless the Father draws them. I want you to think about that. Nobody suddenly wakes up. Nobody suddenly feels a love for God or a faith in God. If you will, we all have a cold heart to God. And the only way that heart warms up is if God draws us. Now the beauty is our eternal Father is drawing people all the time to himself. But not everybody responds. Part of this being drawn to God or this warm heart requires you to respond. And so God is in the business of drawing, and as we respond, something happens. It's kind of like an electrical appliance. You've got to plug it in for the power to be there, and then when you switch it on, let's use a kettle, for instance, or a hot pot. You plug it in, and you fill it with water, and then you switch the hot pot on, and then the element heats up, and the water starts boiling. That's what happens in each person's life as God starts to work in their lives and draws them to himself, and they respond. It's like they switch the hot pot on. Even though God may be drawing, many people are not interested. The switch is off. And until they put the switch on, 
They do not warm up to God. Here's the tragedy. There are many who are not warming up to God. They're cold. They're lost. They're confused. They're heading in the wrong direction. Their lives are a mess. In God's eyes, their lives are a mess. Now, Nancy, the beauty is God doesn't give up. God is in the business of plugging as many people in as he can. And he's waiting for people to switch the power on that can allow them to warm up to him. So that's the first thing I want you to get a hold of. Nobody's coming to God unless the Father's drawing them, and he is. But many are not responding. Many are cold toward God. However, there are those who are warming up to him. And in order to be a disciple, that warming has got to start taking place where you and I start becoming aware of God and finally we put our faith in him. As many as receive him, as many as believe in him, as many as surrender their lives to him, they become children of God. Now the greatest priority of the kingdom of God as we understand it in the gospel, is that people will find that with God. As important as it is for your body that gets sick to heal, and I want it to heal and be healthy, compared to you and me warming up to God and being born again, being healed is small potatoes. You will get healed and get healthy, but you'll get sick again and you will die. And I will die. And that'll be the end of this physical life. But what is going on eternally, what's going on spiritually, has implications for ever and ever and ever. So if you want to know what's on God's top priority, it's that people will warm up to Him and they will find that relationship that He's longing to develop with them. That's why I believe Jesus said, I want you to go and make disciples. If you want to know what's on God's heart, he wants everybody to become a disciple. And that's not the same as coming to worship. And that's not the same as going through some religious practices. That is a heart that's warmed to God, that's surrendered to God, that's walking with God. That's where God is leading. And he's wanting us to join him in that effort. God has a team. I'm going to tell you what that team's called. Kelly? It's called the disciple-making team. God's highest priority. He sent Jesus to make disciples. He sent Jesus to warm people's hearts. He sent Jesus to bring forgiveness and new life to all of us. And as Jesus accomplishes all of that, he ends his ministry by saying, now I want you to go and make disciples. I want you to help me in this mission, in this effort. So that's how we become disciples. God draws, we warm up, we finally come to acknowledge who he is and what's going on in our lives, and we healed ourselves to God. We repent of our sin, we believe him, we follow him. That is the big transaction. That is the big deal that God is trying to accomplish in each and every life. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. Not everybody's a child of God. Everybody's created by God. But in order to become a child of God, you and I have got to be born again. We've got to surrender our lives to following Jesus. So that's where we must start. That must be real in your life and mine. Until that becomes real, we'll be incapable of really making disciples. So if I use our basketball example, until you are interested in basketball, until you are making use of the opportunities, until you are practicing and playing, it's unlikely that you're going to recruit others to play basketball or teach them how to play basketball. If that's something that's not in your interest or in your daily activity, it's highly unlikely that you're going to become a coach or an enthusiast or somebody that can teach skills to another person who wants to learn to play the game. That's where it starts. But that is not where it ends. Once you become an enthusiastic, 
basketball player, then all of a sudden you look for others to play with. When I was in Altus, I had a young boy, he was about 10 years old. He was very interested in basketball. So he said, Dad, I'd like you to get me one of those basketball goals and put it up in the driveway. And Dad did it. And then he got his basketball. And every time I went past that house, you know what I saw? I saw little Kyle. He was dribbling the ball. He was shooting day and night. It would be almost dark. And there's little Kyle shooting hoops because he wanted desperately to play basketball. And he got better and better. Finally, when he got to high school, he actually got picked for the team. Now, he wasn't a champion, but he was getting better. And as he practiced and he worked with others, his game got better and better. And eventually, he was a starting player. In fact, his senior year at Woodward, he was a starter, had a great year. And who he was and what he did was shared with others, the whole team. They were all in that together. They were learning together and competing together. Disciple making is very much like that. It starts with you and your interest and your commitment and the growth that takes place in you. And then all of a sudden you start connecting with others and you become a part of a team. Disciple making is a team effort. It's not a solo sport. So let's talk a little bit about how we do discipleship here. I must confess this morning that we are not the most effective at making disciples. We make few. Last year, I think we had nine professions of faith. Several hundred of us, but only nine that we know of that came to a surrendered life in Christ. Now, I'm not making light of those nine. They're good. But we're not very effective. We're very slow at making disciples. And the reason is, I guess, the way we go about it. And we're not alone in this. This is the North American dynamic. This is how most North American Christians make disciples. Let's talk about how we do it. What do we offer? Mostly we offer worship. We offer a worship experience. And when you meet somebody and you make a friend of them, somewhere along the line, you might invite them to join us for worship. And that's a beautiful thing. And I want you to keep doing it. But coming to worship is not the most effective way to come into a relationship with God. It helps you. You become aware of God. You learn some stuff. But for many people, it takes months and sometimes even years to move from coming to worship to surrendering your life to Christ. What else do we do besides worship? Tell me. How do we get people interested? We pray for them. We pray with them and for them, not just for them, but with them. And we offer Bible studies. Come and join us at a Bible study. Or we offer maybe a choir. If you're interested in music, come and join us and sing with us. Or we have a vacation Bible school and we're going to teach them about the Lord and we're going to use that week-long experience to welcome kids and get them kind of used to what being a part of the church is. We do services, worship services, educational services, missional services, as a way to expose people to what it means to be a Christian. And if we're intentional, we pray, and we try to nudge them in that direction. So yeah, I must ask now, how do you nudge somebody in their relationship with God? What do you do to nudge them? Real life. What do you do? What do I do? You make a relationship and you hope that in that relationship you can start to talk about who God is to you and how you came to know God. And if you're bold, and most of us are not, you might ask this question. I hope you'll start asking it. How are you doing spiritually? How many people do you think ask others that question? Very few. And yet that is the most important question that we can ask someone. How are you doing spiritually? Or you can say it another way, Ramey. Tell me about your faith journey, about who's God to you? How, how does that relationship look? Most times they'll say, well, I, I grew up in the church, or I didn't grow up in the church, or my parents were Christians, or they weren't Christians, whatever. They'll have some answer. Everybody knows what that looks like or doesn't look like. 
And you won't know unless you ask. And I think it's important that you ask. You will never be a disciple maker unless you ask. Now, I want you to pray for them, and I want you to invite them to a Bible study, and I want them to come and worship. But it's going to take much more than that, especially if we're going to make many disciples. And the fast track is when you and I pray for them and say, Lord, how do I take this person and lead them closer to you? And one of the ways you can do that is to ask them, how are things going spiritually? And listen. And then there's a follow-up question. How can I pray for you? How can I pray with you? Now let me tell you what I think happens when you do that. Lacey, when you say to somebody, how are you doing spiritually? And they tell you, and then you ask them, what would you like me to pray for? And they say, pray for this. And you do with them, in my mind, it's like you took that person and you carried them all the way to the feet of Jesus and you left them there. Now, I must remind you that you cannot save somebody. I can't. And hard as we might try, I can't really convict them and turn them around. I can guilt them a bit and share a few scriptures, but the truth is that deep, painful conviction that comes from God only comes from God. That drawing only comes from God. That spiritual awakening only comes from God. But when you take somebody and you put them at the feet of Jesus, they have their best chance of awakening. They have the best chance there of experiencing conviction. They have the best chance there of hearing how much God loves them. And every time you have an opportunity to pray for somebody, it's as if you took them and said, and now I'm leaving you at the feet of Jesus. And if you're really bold, Drew, you can say to them, if I can help you in any way in your relationship with God, I'd like to do that. I will read with you. I'll pray with you. If you want to come to worship, I'll sit with you. If there's anything I can do to help you move closer to God, I want to do that. I'm interested in that. That's important to me. I'm not pushing on you. I'm just saying, show me how I can help you get to where God wants you to be. These are not difficult questions, but they're not questions we often use. But I pray they'll become very normal for us. That it won't be long in a friendship and we'll be asking somebody, so tell me how you're doing spiritually. And what can I pray for? And you know, if they say, no, everything's good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Let's give God thanks right now that everything's good in your life. Because God is taking good care of you. Sincere. From your heart to theirs. So, worship, Bible studies, friendship, conversation. This is kind of how we do it. And our conversion rate is slow. You know, some people will be in a church for years, in a community, before they really surrender their lives to Christ. I think they could get there quicker if they had you and me helping them, putting an arm around them and saying, would you like to dribble with me? Would you like to shoot a few hoops? Would you like me to show you how I make that downtown shot? Why I'm successful? As you and I kind of share and coach and get involved, little Kyle, it wasn't long he had a friend shooting hoops with him. And finally they were on the team together. And then they were thick as thieves. They did everything together. That's how we ought to be. We are the friend of sinners. So he has the next question. How many sinner friends do you have? And how often are you praying for them and helping them? As you look at them, you see more than friendship. You see somebody that God is leading into a closer walk with him. God wants you to be the friend of sinners. Not so that you run in their sins, so that you shine your light, so that you lead them closer to him. How do we become disciples? When somebody else who is a disciple takes an interest in us and then shows us how to connect with God. Now you will meet people like the text said. You'll go to a town and you'll offer the peace of God and they'll say, we're not interested. You can have it back. And you just take it back. Not everybody you're going to reach out to is going to be responsive. Don't worry about that. Look for the ones who are responsive. 
Look for the ones who are warming up to God. Take an interest in them, pray for them, encourage them, befriend them, help them find what God has for them. And the ones who say, no thanks, the kingdom of God has come to them. But they have said, no, they've rejected. And the sad reality is many are rejecting, but it is not your business who's rejecting. It's your business to find out who is warming up, who's being drawn, and for you to invest in them. Give them your best. What resources do you have? I'm glad you asked. You can read. God can use that. You can speak. God can use that. You can pray. God can use that. If you've got a vehicle, you can give somebody a ride. There are a large number of gifts and resources that you have. If you've got a home, invite them to your home. Cook them a meal. Write them a card. Invest in their lives, but not just because you're such a nice person, but because you're a disciple and your highest priority is to try and help them become a disciple. Not manipulate. We're not pressuring. We are loving people into the kingdom. And guess what? Janie wants to use you and your resources and your words and your prayers and your home and anything you've got to help lead them into that relationship. I'm going to close. The most effective disciple making that's happening on the planet is called disciple making movements. They don't have buildings. They don't have all that we have. They have the gospel. And the gospel is alive inside of them. And they share it with others. And there's seven things they do, and I'm going to run through those quickly. I'll tell you about them later on again. The first is what Jesus did. Who knows what Jesus did before he chose any disciples? What was his first task? He spent a whole night praying. A whole night. I don't think that was the only night. I think he had done much praying before. But before he actually started, he spent a whole night praying. And after he prayed, he heard from God. And then he obeyed God. What he's praying for? That you will hear God. And then you will obey God. And then you will go. After Jesus had finished praying and hearing from God, he went and he started to invite. And some said yes, and many said no. But finally he had 12. And many others. We heard about 72 here, huh? In fact, we believe there were hundreds that responded to him in some way. Jesus was just one. But he started this whole disciple-making movement. He started it by praying. He started it by hearing God. He started it by obeying God. And then he went and he started to fish. John, most of our fishing is with a fishing pole. But most of the Bible fishing is with nets. People working together to take the net and gather the fish. Jesus started his fishing, I think, like a fishing pole, one solo. But after a while, they started fishing together, and big crowds came. You can fish by yourself if you want, but you can fish with others. When you work with others, when you pray with others, when you gather with others, when you do Bible study together, that's like fishing with a net. You've got to go, and you've got to fish. You've got to cast the net. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. And once you start to gather and connect with the fish, then you've got to start to train the fish how to become disciples. And not just disciples, but disciples who make disciples. And this is how we do it. We don't read God's word for information. We read it for obedience. What is Jesus saying? How do I obey it? And once I've got that figured out, how do I share that with somebody else? So let me use a simple example. Jesus says... Freely you've received, now I want you to freely give. How do I obey that? I go and start to give. I take what he's given me and I give. I give to my family, my friends. I look for ways to share what God's given me. And when I share it with somebody else and they get interested, I say, hey, Austin, you want to be a disciple? Uh-huh. You must take what God's given you and you must share it with others. You must obey that. It's not a suggestion. You don't have to do it. But if you want to be a disciple, you must do it. If you don't do it, you won't be a disciple. 
you won't be a good follower of Jesus. You're not going to be able to make that downtown shot. You can only make that shot if you keep practicing and doing what the coach told you. There are lots of those kinds of instructions that Jesus gives very practically. The Father is looking for worshipers. You want to be a good disciple? You must worship. I hear people say, well, I'm really busy. I, I know. You know what that means? You're not a good disciple. If you don't obey what Jesus says, you're not a good disciple. And it's unlikely you're going to make somebody else a good disciple. But if you're a good basketball player and you're practicing and you're shooting, pretty good chance you're going to land up on a team and you're going to get others on the team and you're all going to be a champion team. So, disciple making movements, read God's word, to hear God's voice, to obey God, to go and share with somebody else. And when they find somebody else who's responding to God, they start to train them how to be disciples. And then they gather others together and they share that message. They study the Bible. And this is what they study for Mackenzie. What is God saying? What do I need to obey? How do I share that with somebody else? You don't need a special teacher. You don't need a special program. You don't need a video study. You need the Word of God and people who are willing to hear what God's saying and obey it and share it. And when people start responding, especially a little group, a youth group, a small children's ministry, a home group, then you start coaching them. Let me tell you what I learned when I started to dribble. This really helped, helped my coordination. Let me tell you about the follow through on that downtown shot. You've got to get your hand up there and your elbow. And if you'll use that technique, it'll help you. You start to coach people what you have learned. You don't have to be an expert. You just got to be in the game. Seven things that we can all do. Disciple making is meant for every believer. And it comes from you being interested. It comes from you and I being committed. It comes from you and I learning and growing and then asking God to show us who the others are that are being drawn to him and us coming alongside and working with them so that they come alive in Christ. And then we ask them the important questions. How are you doing spiritually? Because you know what? God's waiting for you to be born again. God's waiting for you to be committed. God wants to grow you and use you and then make you a disciple maker. The end of this relationship is reproducing. It's not just staying stagnant. It's helping others come to know him. Pray for them. Speak to them. Love on them. Use what God's given you. All across our planet today, people who have very little money, who have no buildings, many of them don't have any transportation, but I'll tell you what they do have. They've come alive in Christ. They've learned to obey his voice. And now they are sharing him with whoever they can find. And all of a sudden, the gospel is being passed on and new disciples are being made, some in the tens of thousands. It works. Now, I'm not saying don't invite them to worship. Please keep inviting them to worship. I'm not saying don't invite them to Bible study. Please keep inviting them to Bible study. I'm not saying don't sit and visit with them and love them. Do all of that. But realize that you have the potential to be a disciple maker right at work right in your home, in your circle of friends. You obey God and then you share that with somebody else. And God will draw them and God will awaken them and God will help him find that deep spiritual connection that he's waiting for. It's his highest priority. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey all the things that I have taught you and I will be with you always this is our business and when we do it as a movement it is highly productive as we take and obey Christ and then share it with somebody else and let them obey him and share that with somebody else then we start to multiply then a church like ours could have hundreds hundreds of people coming to know Christ why because we're all sharing we're all helping people move closer we're all nurturing and coaching it's not easy, but it's of the highest priority. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray that as we read your word, we'll read it in a new way. 
will ask you, what are you trying to tell me? What are you teaching me about who you are and who I am and what you want me to do? How do I obey you? And then how do I share it with somebody else? Everything we know, help us to find those you are drawing to themselves, drawing into that closer relationship with you and share it with them. Make us enthusiastic, committed disciple makers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll remain seated as we sing close to thee. The application is simple. May God stir interest in us. Interest to be a disciple and interest to make a disciple. If it's not there, it's not going to happen. God's got to stir that in you and me. We've got to become inspired to pass this on. This is how Jesus said it. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And righteousness is not just what you have with God. It's what God wants with everybody, a right relationship, a close relationship. I pray that God will give us a desire, a hunger, a thirst to be a part of that and to help others be a part of that. And then to equip us in a very practical way to do that in our friendships as we go about our daily living. If you'd like to pray, please come forward. Everybody's always welcome to come to the altar. Father, today my heart is sad because as I look back, in so many ways I haven't been the best disciple maker. So many opportunities I have missed along the way. Forgive me. I don't want to feel guilty or disappointed. I want to feel inspired and motivated. My heart is trembling inside to be a disciple and to help others be one. Show me how, show us how we can move people closer and closer to you. To pray more fervently. To use the resources you've given us to help them get closer to you. And finally to be born again and grow into the disciples you want them to be. Mobilize us, all of us here at Victory Memorial, to be friends of sinners. 
to be able to shine your light and speak your love as we obey you and help others to obey you. Move in our lives, Holy Spirit, we pray. Thank you for helping Bill Landis in that accident and saving his life and his leg. Help him as he's recovering. Thank you for helping Anthony Ramirez after that terrible accident he had. Thank you that he's on the mend. It was so good to see him and visit with him this week. Thank you for helping Sabrina and her family as they've had to let go of Lily as she's passed on and graduated into your eternity. Continue to comfort them and bless them. The same for Ginevra Powell's family as she's finished her earthly journey and gone home to be with you, be with all of her family. Lord, thank you for all of those that you've helped get over this flu and bronchitis, all that's been going around. We are so thankful for your help and healing. Most of all, we are thankful that we are spiritually awakened, that we can say we are born again and filled with your spirit, that our names are written in heaven, that that is the greatest gift you can give to us and help us to give that to others, to help them find you and learn to serve you. Make Gaiman a holy city. Make Victory Memorial a blessing center. Make each one of us a disciple maker. As we pray the prayer you taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Powerful YouTube music video today. Build your kingdom here. If you know the word, sing along. If you want to stand, feel free to do that. Let's make this a song of commitment as we sing, God, show me how to be one of these disciple makers, I pray. Amen. I pray that song will echo in your heart. I pray that you will sense the interest and the inspiration of the kingdom. I pray that God would equip you and me to be all that he wants us to be so we can be a good disciple and make disciples of others. Do not be afraid. Do not think you are not qualified. If you know Jesus, you can help somebody else get to know him. Receive God's blessing as we leave worship and go into the mission field. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.